I'll call to order our next, our regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting. Again, uh, because of the organizational meeting that began at 7 o'clock, this regular meeting is now started at 7.13. Um, we have a different slate of officers today. I am, have been selected as Vice President, and the President, Angela Brandstadt, cannot be here tonight, so I'll run the meeting in her place. If I could ask for a roll call, Vice Secretary McFarland. Sure. Uh, President Brandstadt, we know is absent. Vice President Singer. Here. I am here. Treasurer Wasserman. Yes, here. Member Baker. Here. Member Frizee. Here. Member Gordon. Here. Okay. Very good, thank you. We'll move on to item two, the consent agenda. We have item 2.1, approval of regular meeting minutes uh, from December 14th. Item 2.2, staff men, uh, member resignations. Item 2.3, the payment of some school bills. And item 2.4, legal invoices for payment. Do we have any additions or deletions to the consent agenda? Okay, I'd entertain a motion. So moved on approving uh, consent agenda 2.0. Support. Very good. Uh, is there any discussion on that? All right, we'll move into vote. All in, play, in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, unanimous. <clears throat> Uh, item three is a request to address the board. There haven't been any scheduled requests, but if anyone in the audience uh, would like to address the board, they can do so at this time. Seeing none, we'll move on to item four. We have the Board of Education Matters presentation to the board, and I'll turn that over to Mr. Sherrill. We have our January Shining Stars first coming up. And our first shining star we're going to do is Sharon Blaylock. Sharon would come up. Some career highlights on Sharon while she's coming up. Has been a paraprofessional with Midland Public Schools for more than 20 years. Has worked with students at East Lawn Elementary and Central Middle Schools. Her assignments throughout the years have included lunch and playground supervision, assisting with special education students, assisting in classrooms, reading with students, and much more. And her nominator had to say this about her. Sharon was nominated for the Shining Star Award by a number of her MPS colleagues. <clears throat> Here are some of their comments. Sharon has one of the strongest work ethics of any paraprofessional I have ever worked with. She goes above and beyond her job description to help all students. She takes ownership in everything she does and has high expectations for students. Sharon comes to school every morning with a smile, a great attitude, and a strong work, work ethic. Excuse me. Without her, East Lawn wouldn't be the same. Sharon makes an impact on her students. Last year, she was invited to the high school graduation party of a child she partnered with at East Lawn. Sharon is one of East Lawn's biggest supporters. She takes pride in our school and in our staff and her work. Sharon is the highest example of an employee who quietly goes the extra mile, never drawing attention to how long or difficult that mile might be. Congratulations, Sharon. Thank you very much. Our second shining star is Kimberly McMahon. Kimberly would come up. Kim's MPS career highlights are, has been with MPS since 1997 as an elementary foreign language teacher. Earned her bachelor's degree from Elma College. Should I say the year? Uh, <laughs> okay, okay. In 1996, and her master's degree from Central Michigan University in 2011. Has taught Spanish mainly at Adams Elementary during her MPS career, but has also taught sections of Spanish at Siebert and Central Middle School. Has developed a very successful culture club program at Adams, I'm sure you've heard about, with fifth grade students, which she presented to the board in the spring of 2014. 
Kim was nominated for the Shining Star by two MPS parents, one of which is also an MPS colleague. Here are some of their comments. Mrs. McMahon has taught my three children Spanish at Adams Elementary. Each year, Ms. McMahon goes above and beyond to make learning Spanish something that is exciting for students. She provides opportunities for reinforcing what is taught in Spanish and outside the school day. It could be watching a movie, learning dances, or attending a fiesta. Ms. McMahon truly gets my students. She understands his quirks and she loves him because of his differences. My student would be the first to tell you the feeling is mutual. My family is the only one of my, my family is only one of many families that has grown richer in our knowledge and appreciation of the world beyond Midland due to Kim's influence and enthusiasm. It is a gift she has given each and every family here at Adams. Kim's hard work and dedication touches the Midland Public Schools community as well as the greater Midland community. Kim's hard work and dedication does not go unnoticed and is greatly appreciated by so many. She is an amazing role model. Congratulations, Kimberly. Well played. Thank you so much. <laughs> Now we're going to move on and um, recognize our board. As many of you know, January is School Board Recognition Month. And in front of you, you have a number of items. Um, and one um, of the items that you should have in each front of you is a book that will be donated to our school libraries um, with your names in it for, to recognize you. You have um, several other items, <clears throat> and then out of those books, there's one for the secondary and there's one for elementary level at each one of them. The second item is some artistic drawings from Plymouth Elementary and Cindy, I forget the teacher's name. Kelly Jacobs. Kelly Jacobs class made for you. So I, I know you guys like those <laughs> items as well. That's great. And I'm gonna read uh, two letters um, that I received. Uh, one of the letter I received, the one from me myself about um, the Board of Education. And I just told you of the beginning part, which was the books in front of you, so I have to re find my spot on my letter. This year, the theme the Michigan Association of School Boards has adopted this school year is School Boards Lead. Our NPS Board of Education is doing a great job of leading and making sure all students succeed. It's an exciting but challenging time in education. You are challenged to make policies and make tough decisions that shape the future of our education system. You bear responsibility for an annual budget nearly $80 million, a student population that is around 7,800 students and around 1,000 employees and a dozen facilities. Your decisions have and will continue to reflect the culture and circumstances of our community. Tonight we take a moment to recognize the important work our school board does, this dedication to this work and the countless hours you dedicate it to ensure everyone every student succeeds and so we thank you for your service and then we have one from that the MCA has asked me to read to you so dear Midland Public Schools board members thank you for serving on the MPS Board of Education the Midland City Education Association recognizes that it's a volunteer position and we appreciate your service to our community and schools we have made a contribution to the MCA scholarship fund in your honor Two MCA scholarships are given annually to the children of MCA members in order to assist the students in the pursuit of an advanced degree. Thank you once again for your contribution to our MPS students and community in the service of students, Midland City Education Association. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Often you don't get recognized for all the work you do and the hours you put in, but tonight you are. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> And what we're probably most excited about presenting tonight is um, our, our artistic and architectural drawing um, of our new STEM elementary school, yet to be named elementary school. And so we have Dale Jerome from French and Associates, Associates with us, and as you, I think you've all met Dale before, and uh, Dale's going to take it over from here. Great, thanks, Mike. Good evening, everyone. It's uh, definitely a privilege to be here with you this evening and uh, share uh, the uh, design for the, the STEM elementary school. I know you, you probably have uh, known that behind the scenes for many months since the bond proposal was passed by your community that we started in earnest working on the new STEM elementary school. And uh, what uh, I'm here 
to share with you tonight is uh, some renderings and uh, uh, an explanation of the design as it currently is out for bids. Um, so it was a great assignment as an architect. I can share my enthusiasm when I knew that uh, this was uh, on our plate. Uh, as the president of our firm, I had the opportunity to pull rank and uh, choose this one specifically. That's how excited I was and our firm was about this opportunity because we were starting with a blank canvas and we knew that this wasn't just going to be another typical elementary school. Um, and so we started uh, many months ago with the programming and design sessions and uh, I believe we included over 30 educators, stakeholders, community members and, pro and dozens of meetings to talk about the final solution that I have to uh, share with you this evening. Um, so to do that, we started with, as I said, a blank slate. We first created a programming document, um, and I don't expect you to read those numbers on the screen. Uh, that's just a prop to show you that this was our starting point, a, a recipe, if you will, for our new elementary school. And we knew that in general terms, we had to create a, a project that would house both Carpenter and East Lawn, approximately 600 students in one location, and that we wanted to be able to add 100 to 150 additional students for a total of 750, um, thank you, uh, 750 students uh, capacity in this uh, new elementary school. And as you can imagine, an elementary school for 750 students is a fairly large elementary school. There aren't that many of those types of One of the uh, unique features that we were asked to consider in the design of this elementary school was that we knew we were building a school specifically that would um, involve STEM curriculum. And uh, the district informed us that you were going down this path and that you would be using Project Lead the Way as the part of the curriculum for um, your STEM program. And as you can see here on this slide, uh, we wanted to be aware of and mindful of these tenets of uh, Project Lead the Way and STEM curriculum as we went into the design of the school. Uh, specifically, the idea is collaboration, uh, research-based um, study we knew would be part of the program. And not only did we want to be mindful of and allow these tenets to influence the design of the school, but our goal was to also come up with a school facility design that would hopefully in return in reciprocal way influence the curriculum of the building as well. And so um, we also introduced another idea to the planning group that we thought would help to uh, do just that, help to have the facility um, be a part of the curriculum, if you will. And uh, so we introduced the concept of a learning community rather than just single classrooms. Uh, we wanted to really stretch the idea of going beyond just the idea of a self-contained box. Uh, we wanted to create an environment where study and tinkering, or the phrase that I came up with, tinkering, could take place. Uh, so we introduced this idea of learning communities um, and create this idea of a, a maker space and STEM studio outside the classroom that could be shared at each grade level. For those who were part of some of the early uh, stakeholder meetings, they probably would recall this diagram that we first introduced to talk about this idea of a learning community. And this happens to show or illustrate the idea of a kindergarten learning community. But the basic concept was that we were creating a, a learning community that, again, would take the classrooms out of themselves into these shared spaces that were adjacent to each grade level. And ultimately, what we ended up with for this concept for each grade level learning community was this diagram that you see here, where we have five classrooms that surround these STEM studio and maker spaces. Connectivity between all of those um, 
rooms within that grade level. And then another key component of, of our, our early planning that stayed and stuck throughout the design, and you'll see carried out in the rendering tonight, is the idea that every grade level learning community would also have out access to this outdoor classroom. And essentially, this learning community is designed to be a whole of five classrooms that are open and flexible. And again, the key is that no one classroom is self-contained. And so we continue <coughs> to develop through uh, the programming with early diagrams, such as this programming diagram, where you see these grade level communities starting to take shape around the floor plan. You see the green blobs here early on reference those outdoor learning communities to ultimately a schematic design plan that looked like this, where after editing, entering through a secure entry into a gateway space, we create this, what became dubbed as a main street. Again, you see the continuation of those grade level learning communities being placed along that main street. It's worth noting here too, one of the unique features of this school is it really is an addition um, because we did the, high, the green shaded areas represented the gym and what was the cafeteria of the middle school that were preserved and will be part of the um, final design of the school. And so what I, I want to share with you tonight is, is that final design for the STEM elementary school. Um, as I may have mentioned earlier in my, um, what I've shared with you already is that the project is actually now out for bids. We're working with Bart and I think they're all siding there behind the screen on uh, getting uh, proposals from contractors for the project. And I'd also like to mention as an aside that much of the work that we did in the design and programming for the new, new elementary school is also going to have effect or impact on all of the elementary schools as we move into the design of those projects because we'll also be creating gym and cafeteria additions and then redeploying some of the existing spaces for STEM studios, makerspace, and media center spaces that will allow for some of the same activities that we're trying to create and make possible in the new elementary school or the newly remodeled elementary school will also take place in those existing schools. So first, uh, as a point of reference, I'll just start by kind of walking you through the site plan. And I'll make note of the fact that, as you are aware, well aware, this is what, this site um, is where what was most re recently called Central Middle School, it still sits today. And on the corner here of Reardon and Rod is the existing um, auditorium. And I want to just jump to the next slide for a second and show you the floor plan. So as you know, um, we are going to demo parts of what was then Central Middle School, the shaded area, the gray shaded areas are essentially the classroom wings, the two-story classroom wings that will come down. As I mentioned a moment ago, the existing gym and cafeteria will then become part of the elementary school, and the existing auditorium and the support spaces around that um, will remain in a, a central auditorium for the district. So if I now jump back to the site plan, see here what will remain of the auditorium or performing arts center. We have the existing gym and cafeteria now essentially swallowed up by the expansion into the elementary school. A couple things about the site. Um, as you are probably well aware, Rod Street is one-way traffic in this direction. So we really um, decided, and, and it was a great opportunity for us to use that traffic flow as a controlling point for access to the elementary school. So we bring in this new auto loop parallel to Rod Street all the way across the front of the building and that's the access point, the secure entry point into the building. We then are creating a separate and distinctly different loop for bus traffic off onto George Street back here. So a really great planning scenario, completely separated um, cars and buses um, as entering and exiting the site. And the, the bus loop then has its own entrance into the back of the building, which is that main street <coughs> corridor here. Um, so by using 
essentially all four sides of the site having street access, we're able to get a really nice separation of traffic around the building. Um, a couple other um, things I'll mention. I mentioned the secure entry here, student entry here off of the bus loop, and we do have a third kind of uh, primary entrance to school. This would be what I would call the events entry with the gym and cafeteria down here at nighttime. We really just use exclusively that entrance to the school. Also, um, play areas are strategically located here in lower L, upper L play areas, as well as you can see there's these um, areas here are the outdoor learning spaces. Uh, just to talk briefly about parking on the site, um, we do have parking dispersed along this um, parent drop-off loop, starting all the way down here, which we pick up some new handicapped spaces in front of the auditorium, and then here in front of the events, and then here at the main entrance. We did add some additional parking along this service drive, which is an extension of the existing service entry to the auditorium, so we just literally extend that down behind, and that becomes the point for deliveries to um, the kitchen area. We extended this parking area on Collins Street. So overall, when we're done with the site, there will actually be a net gain, slight net gain of total parking on the site as what was there before when it was last used as a uh, middle school. There, out, there will be some uh, retention areas on the site as well to meet the new requirements for drainage and so forth. Um, we do need to do that, and I'll talk a little bit more about this one in particular as I move through the presentation. So this is the final floor plan um, where we currently sit. Um, and you can see it, it bears pretty strong resemblance to some of the earlier diagrams. Again, secure entrance leads into a vestibule, and once the school day starts, the only option at that point of entry is to go directly <coughs> into the office office flanks that entry and has good supervision, vision of the people that come into the building. Once a person is checked in and is, is given access to the school, they then come out into this gateway or common space and have access to that main street um, corridor. And here you see the grade level learning communities that are lined up along that um, corridor. Then there's kind of a secondary corridor that extends down along what was the cafeteria and will become the media center, leads us down the hallway past what was the gym, which will now become the cafeteria stage and kitchen area. And we're actually adding an elementary sized gym onto the side of the building there between what was the gym and the auditorium would of course be down here. So a very um, well um, ordered, uh, floor plan um, with a good secure entry and, and again each of those grade level learning communities being able to operate surrounding the STEM studio and makerspace that you see are part of each one of those um, grade levels. So this is um, the beginning of some rendered images um, and this is just starting with a colored version of the site plan. Again, this would be the auditorium, and this is the new STEM elementary after we add on to existing um, gym and cafeteria spaces. You kind of get a feel for the footprint of this building. It's pretty large, um, and uh, that's because, again, we're housing up to 750 students um, in this elementary school when it's at capacity. So I'm just going to begin walking you through some images. Uh, this would be an aerial uh, view, uh, kind of if you were sitting at uh, uh, Rod and Reardon looking down from the air, um, you would see the events entry here and the auto loop coming across the front of the building. This would be the main entrance to the building. In general, the palette is um, just standard uh, brick. We're using two colors, some burnished um, concrete masonry on the upper portions and then uh, metal siding, some metal roof in key areas, and then a high efficiency tinted glass and some translucent panels in the clear story areas of the STEM studios. Um, I would say that uh, we tried to, in 
the architecture of the building, if you will, use some of the community uh, influences. In particular, um, Alden Dow is a well-known architect, not only in your area, but also nationally. And we wanted to try to have that some influence. While I wouldn't say this is you know, a copy of any of that architecture, it certainly tries to be mindful that that is an influence in your, your community. Uh, this view then comes further down and is actually would be from uh, Rod and Collins looking back towards the school in the other direction. Here you're looking down on the extension of the parking along Collins. These would be the lower L play areas. These are the outdoor learning areas or classrooms. These blue metal panel and terracotta metal roof areas are the STEM studio and make space of each grade level. Uh, just a quick note there, you do see little things like this. We're actually planning for educational purposes, there'd be a small solar array and a green roof on the building that the students can monitor as part of the curriculum. Uh, this is just um, continuing down Collins now and starting to wrap around the back of the building. And here in the lower left hand corner, you start to see what would be the student entry from the bus loop. This takes us completely around the back of the school then. And this box right here is what was the gymnasium, now cafeteria, kitchen, and stage area of the elementary school. You can see that there's a, a blue uh, shingle style uh, metal panel that we're planning to use on the existing um, upper brick portions of the gym box. Um, we're then staining and tuck pointing the lower part. Um, I'm hoping that this uh, panel becomes affectionately dubbed by the uh, elementary students uh, dragon scales. So, um, also a point here, I talked a little while ago that there will be some retention areas that we have to have on the site for uh, drainage purposes for stormwater. And in this case, we're taking the trouble to enhance that so that it doesn't just look like the typical retention basin with chain link fence around it that you might envision when I say retention basin. Uh, maybe a more appropriate term of what we're creating is a bioswale. So it will be educational and one of the alternates that we're including in the documents is actually a covered, or a boardwalk, not covered, a boardwalk through that bioswale area so that can become an extension of the outdoor learning area for the upper L grade levels. So now we come down to street level and we start to again walk around the building. So this is the view from Rod Street uh, as you're looking here at on this right hand side the events entry and then down here kind of tucked in behind these trees which apparently are going to go, grow at a very rapid rate <laughs> uh, sort of blocking our view of the, uh, the main entrance. Got some really hardy trees. <coughs> So here I jump in behind that tree, so it's no longer blocking our view. And this would be the main and secure entrance of the building. On the right-hand side here, you see the office block has good visibility and supervision of the main entrance. This then continues to wrap down the front of the building, looking back at the, the secure entry from another vantage point further down the auto loop. You can see it is a fairly tall space, but we've introduced this lower uh, element to kind of bring the scale down to a more kid-friendly level. And then this is just continuing on, on down closer to the intersection of uh, Rod and Collins. So we start to wrap around the building and see the beginning of the um, outdoor classroom side of the building. This view looks towards that side of the building with the outdoor classrooms, specifically the lower L uh, play areas in the foreground and then the outdoor learning. And as I mentioned earlier, this, these walls would be the entrances to and from the uh, STEM studios at each grade level.
continuing to wrap around the back of the building now. Um, these are again, this would be the upper L side with uh, STEM studios, outdoor learning area, and then this would be that bioswale um, that would have the, the boardwalk um, through it for educational purposes. And then this kind of just zooms back away from and captures the entire back of the building. Here you can see again the, the gymnasium box, or excuse me, the, the prior gym, now uh, cafeteria stage. This is the new gym that's added onto the side. And these are, again, now outdoor learning and uh, upper L classroom areas. This is then zooming back in and kind of looking at the end of the building where the student entry is. This would be the paving of the bus loop. Uh, a couple things I note here. Uh, these are the outside walls of the three classrooms in one of the upper L um, learning communities. And the window pattern is intentionally uh, unique and random in some ways, but also strategic. So if you can imagine, if you're an elementary shorter sized person, there's the perfect height for you to see out the window. If you're an adult teacher or a person in the classroom standing height, there's your perfect view to the outside world. And if one of those two don't work, we put in a vertical <laughs> one that captures any size and shape. And basically, you're seeing the, uh, the, the side wall of three classrooms there along that facade. And then this, again, is the student entry. This zooms in on that student entry. Again, bringing a, a, a canopy, a, a protected area before you enter the building. Also, um, this element here is intended, again, to have some relationship to some of the Dow architecture in the community, just one of those elements. And this spire on this masonry pier will actually end up being a uh, functional uh, weather station, again, for the students to have access to and monitor capabilities. This then is the final uh, image uh, from the street level view. And this takes us back around to the front of the building and shows an entrance what, to what I call the events entry. So again, at night, if you're just there to for a basketball or a, a play or whatever in the elementary um, cafeteria or gym, it has its own independent entry. And it allows that end of the building to be self-contained and not have people wandering through the entire uh, school just to get to an event in the uh, cafeteria or gymnasium. Now I'm just going to take you inside. One of the areas in particular um, that we wanted to uh, render and highlight for you. As I mentioned, each uh, grade level will have a STEM studio, a maker space. And so this gives you a view inside of those, what, what, what it would look like from the inside. Uh, this happens to be from one of the uh, STEM studio maker spaces looking towards the outside wall. So beyond these doors, that takes you out to the outdoor classroom. Uh, you can see uh, there will be garage doors between the classrooms in the STEM studio. Um, we're going to be using uh, polished concrete floors so that um, messes and things like that are not an issue. Uh, we literally wanted to, you know, in some ways, allow this STEM studio maker space to have some of the characteristics of a shop class, if you will. Um, you can see these upper bands of translucent um, panels. Uh, this happens to be an actual duct sock. It's a fabric material that will distribute the air in the STEM studio maker space. And then lighting and structure is intentionally exposed. This then is in that same space looking back the other directions. So now I'm at the other end, maybe coming just coming in from the outdoor classroom and looking back through that STEM studio maker space. The maker space is intended to be primarily housed at this end of the building. This actually shows a bank of cabinets that would have a sink for access to water. And then these doors lead out into the Main Street corridor. Uh, this, um, these two images show a little bit of splash of color, um, some green in this case. But um, if 
you don't like green, not to worry. There's five other learning communities, and <laughs> they will all be a different color. So this is an elementary school, and we do want to have some fun with color. And so um, as you can see, that was the color <coughs> scheme that was illustrated. But each grade level will have a slightly different color, and um, each one of them will have a fairly strong accent color that is woven within some common common uh, materials throughout the building. Again, we're just trying to uh, create an environment that's fun and inviting to an elementary age student. Um, with that, um, I'd be happy to answer any questions <coughs> if you have them or if you're tired of listening to me, that's okay too. I have a question. Go, sir. Um, first of all, excellent presentation. Uh, that is very, very exciting to see this starting to come to fruition. Um, one thing I just I thought of quickly when you mentioned there was a solar array uh, that the, the kids may be able to explore. Um, have has there been any discussion or uh, research on expanding that? I mean, there's a lot of roof space uh, that, in my mind, I think would be a great opportunity to uh, place some solar arrays on there too. Let, to reduce our carbon footprint and to kind of offset uh, maybe some of our electrical uh, usage with the building. We did look at that um, at, at was whether or not it would make sense at a greater scale. And our, our initial findings are that the payback period is fairly significant. Uh, excuse me, the, the time that it would take to pay back that investment is very significant. And we were concerned that that might not be a good investment as far as an initial first cost. So um, the solar array that we're putting there will contribute to the, the power in the building, but it will admittedly be fairly minimal and more for educational purposes. There will be a metering capability and some software that will allow the students to monitor it. So it really is intended to be more of an educational tool than um, a, a functional um, solar array, if you will. Okay. Um, as I do work at Case Western Reserve University, you guys have heard yeah. me talk about this. Uh, one thing on your maker space that you may want to consider mm -hmm. is is making sure you have plenty of uh, uh, drains in those okay. concrete floors. Uh, you're expecting kids to make stuff, yeah. making messes, having drains where slopes yeah. and slight sloping, etc., makes that it's something you can do when you build, you can't do it later. Yeah, and, and just to put your mind at ease, uh, I mentioned the concrete floors, and we, we do uh, actually already have uh, planned into the design of those floor areas, floor drains, because yep. we're expecting the messes to be made. Yep. I, we're, I'm hoping that thinkering will actually take yep. place. <clears throat> and how did, uh, what were your, uh, your different staff inputs on the garage door concept, open windows, et cetera, into sure. that makerspace? Great question. Uh, I would say, admittedly, that at first, uh, it was, uh, there was, I could see the reserved look on their faces. Um, and I understand the uh, concern that there might be some distractions. Um, you know, there's activity outside the classroom. Uh, but I think uh, we pushed and, and they, they moved. And uh, there was, I think, a general understanding that this was going to be a different educational environment than maybe what we might typically expect to see in an elementary school. And that um, movement um, in and out of the classroom and some of the activities uh, that they would do in the classroom would now move out to the STEM studio and maker space. So, so one, we're anticipating that movement back and forth will be kind of free flow. And that um, as students adapt to this environment, um, I anticipate that they will adapt to it much more readily <laughs> than some, some of the adults, <coughs> admittedly. And, uh, but I, I think that in general, after we talk through the concepts and the direction that we're trying to achieve, that the group did embrace the idea and they, they, they made a promise to me that no one would put paper over the glass. <laughs> That's and, the first thing uh, I thought. <laughs> and um, my goal or my dream is that 
the, after a few months of the school being occupied and I get a chance to visit the facility that I'll walk into most of the learning communities and see the majority of those garage doors open most of the time. That's really what we're hoping for. Again, that open and collaborative environment. I, I'm almost steal Brian's thunder, so yeah. I'm going to leave it at that. But, but that, and I think Brian may touch on it, this, that's the uh, essential component of retraining our teachers for this to be able to teach in here. So you can't think of our tr elementary schools as they exist and teaching in that manner. You've got to think about how we're going to be teaching in this building. It's going to be vastly different. So, And if we're wrong, it's reversible. Correct. You, yes. You paper paper yeah. over the windows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, we, and we actually talked about that. You know, um, we, want, we did actually... Um, Unlike some of the past designs, you know, everybody probably has seen or been familiar with an open classroom, open concept mm -hmm. school in the past, and those didn't really have a bailout plan, if you will, built into the design. This has, if you will, the ability to go back to and be a more traditional elementary school if for some reason the need emerges to go back to that. I hope it doesn't. I don't anticipate it. Uh, but if, if needed, that that option is there. Um, I don't know if Brian's going to show that part or not, but there's a lot more to these outdoor learning classrooms than Dale briefly showed you here as well. And so, um, you know, he talked about some of the teaching elements of the building, um, but I think there's there's some more. Yeah. Uh, you um, want to touch on any of that? I don't know if you saw any in maybe some of the images. probably saw some indication of actually impressions made in the concrete, things like that. Um, and we do plan on using those areas for educational purposes. So here you see, you know, there will be, you know, literally embedded and stained in the concrete, world maps, solar systems, things of that nature. Uh, an actual, we're talking about a, a kind of a Simulated riverbed in the upper L side. You see boulders and things embedded in the concrete. So what we're trying to do is, if you're familiar with the Project Lead the Way curriculum, each grade level has a specific emphasis. And both inside and outside of those STEM studios, we're picking up elements of those curriculum emphases. Is that the right? Yeah. Plural version of emphasis. <laughs> um, we're picking those up in each of the grade levels. Um, also anticipating um, that uh, every part of a STEM studio or even all parts of the building will just reinforce the, the STEM curriculum. So if we have you know, flat panels around the building, anytime they're not being controlled by either a student or um, educator, they will have rolling imagery that will you know, relate to the curriculum. Um, so whether if if anatomy is part of it, there will be, you know, visual, images of skeletons emerging, just as an example. Um, if we're talking about, you know, you know, something related to pulleys and gears, um, those will be in. And we're really taking those elements outside as well as, as uh, Mike indicated. So uh, we envision, you know, we actually, it's kind of hard to see. It don't, doesn't really illustrate it in the rendering, but this area over here, we will have an excess amount of topsoil on the site like this, and it's common. So rather than just carting that off, we're actually going to burn that area up here over. And one of the elements of the curriculum has to do with flight. And so this will actually become a mini uh, Orville and Wright uh, launching pad over here for uh, uh, flight. So um, everywhere we can, our goal has been through the design to think of ways that the building will contribute to the curriculum. Uh, in classrooms, instead of burying uh, rain conductors in the wall, those pipes will actually be outside the wall. And not only will they hear the rainwater coming through those pipes, but in some sections they'll actually see, because we're putting in glass pipe, they'll see the water flow through the pipe. Uh, in areas that we might try to hide uh, piping at the in between uh, restrooms. There will actually be a window so the students can walk up in and see all the piping and the, the parts of the building that we typically try to hide um, will be exposed. 
within the media center, there's actually a window into the boiler room. So um, every time we could think of a way to make the facility contribute to the education of the student, we tried to add that element into the design and still be cost effective, right, Carol? Yeah. <laughs> on, on the swale area, um, I love what, what you're trying to do there versus just a nondescript hole in the ground pond. Um, I know it's going to be dry a vast majority of the time. Correct. Um, any safety issues of access when it's not, or when we have after a heavy rain that we have certain levels? What are you anticipating levels, and what do we have to deal with there? From from the high rim elevation to the, the low point of that area is is only a little over four feet, um, and we don't really anticipate it ever filling up with water. There might be, if there's a real strong, um, you know, like a 10-year flood type of storm, there might be, you know, a short period of time where, you know, there would be standing water. But it would, it would flow into uh, the stormwater system fairly rapidly. There's a release. Understand. I, I was just, you know, yeah. worried about what the max sustainable yeah, level no, we may have in there with, with children running around. It's also um, a nice way for us to introduce a green component to the site. So yeah. this bioswale, by using, again, um, educational and also native um, uh, landscape grasses, materials that you would see throughout the Midwest and specifically Michigan, those will be planted in there. So not only is it a green functional bioswale, but it's also an educational piece for the student. I have another question. Uh, you talked briefly about the main entrance by the office being a secure entrance. Mm -hmm. uh, how are the other entrances to the building secured? And can you expand a little bit about some of the other uh, security features embedded within the building? Yeah, okay. So uh, basically, <coughs> this being the main secure entrance as i said once the school day starts every other entry to the building will be locked and only way into the building unless you have card access and the right privileges to some other strategic location your only way into the building would be through this doorway okay and and as i said if you can picture the typical vestibule that second set of doors would then also be locked and really your only option when you enter this building would be to go into the office and check in. Okay. So that's number one, is that that becomes the gatekeeper of this school, that main secure entry. Other entrances for strategic and functional reasons will have card access readers or some type of proximity reader. Um, we're actually looking at those systems right now. That'll be part of a later bid package, some of the electronics. But we're making provisions so that entrances to the STEM studios, for instance, from the outdoor learning, a teacher would have a proximity access capability at those. Uh, same thing with this rear entrance. So if there are uh, students on the playground when they're ready to come back in to this part of the building, again, through card access or some type of proximity reader. But aside from those locations that have those electronic access capabilities, all the other doorways would be locked uh, during the school day and that is the um, you know again this gatekeeper concept the other thing that we are evaluating and, and working with uh, technology on is uh, lockdown procedures apps <coughs> controls um, throughout the school we walk a fine line in school facilities between open transparent collaborative spaces and secure ones. Um, I would say that um, we're trying to get a good balance of both, but admittedly, the the flow and openness of the building is is probably that side of the pendulum. We're leaning a little more towards that. Again, anticipating that the best feature is this one and only point of access to the school once the school day begins. The, okay. th there's um, eight to ten card reader accesses, eight to ten cameras uh, projecting out there. Um, think of those STEM studios. They're open and collaborative, but technically, if we could close those exterior doors to each STEM area and we could lock those quickly, 
the whole idea to keep bad guys out <coughs> and to delay them. We're never going to stop them if they're coming through. They get delayed at the Sally Port entry, well, and hopefully that holds them from there. But if they were to get in the building, we have the potential to lock those STEM studios. They'll delay them again before they get to the classrooms. Now, if you got kids out in the STEM studio, you get caught off guard. No different than being caught on the playground. But okay. Another thing I see is uh, a plus when it comes to safety is with the, the space that we have to use and and the traffic flow. I think that's a huge plus as far as keeping the bus traffic away from mm -hmm. the parent traffic and allowing that long um, drive uh, coming up to the elementary school that allows Correct. parents to drop their kids off and not to be too congested and then not to back up Rod Street and the other yeah, streets right. around. So I think that's a big plus. I yeah, go through I, that I, every I morning, so I love that idea. Yeah, <laughs> In and yes. out, flowing all the way through the bus loop on the back, but also on the bus loop in the back, uh, potentially it's going to be gated. And so yes. only the buses will be able to release the gate and come through so the no parents could quickly sneak in between the buses and drop them off. Now at night we have the ability to leave that gate open and have them uh, uh, be able to use that for parking. So some more security that way, traffic flow security. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty rare commodity to have an elementary site that allows you to have a distinct and separate street for a car, uh, bus, and delivery traffic to all enter from a different point. So it's uh, actually a, a very unique and desirable site from that standpoint. Dale, one thing um, um, you can touch on, I don't know, probably better than I can, is on the Auditorium Performing Arts Center. Um, I don't know if you guys caught that, how much of that building stays with that Performing Arts Center. And so um, I think the roof line kind of shows it, Dale, where, where it's much more than just a Performing Arts Center. Yeah, so uh, it's still, it's, it's more, the, so the actual footprint of the, the house, the seating area, and the stage of the auditorium is this, this central component here. There's a, there's a hallway and the lobby area that wraps all the way around that, but all of the existing spaces, there's a, like a mini lecture hall, um, some practice spaces, I think they use them for bands, and things like that back here in rehearsals, uh, the old band room, all the scene shop and, and the large media center on the uh, second floor, those spaces will all still be part of this facility. So it, it definitely, if you look at, you know, we're probably keeping as much or more space than we're <coughs> demolishing from that building. So just touch a little bit. They were still in the early stages on that, but yeah. you understand that's going to be a big footprint itself. In fact, it may be um, as big as, if not larger, than the elementary itself. Yeah, with the two two stories, it's probably close. I mean, you can kind of see in the the rendering images um, maybe a little bit in footprint because the elementary school is just one story, and the auditorium has many portions that are two stories. But in terms of the massing of the two buildings, um, you can see that you know the auditorium by no means is dwarfed by the presence of this yep. uh, building on the site. It's again, admittedly, more spread out, but within that footprint, there's a, there's a lot of space that remains. So there might be some opportunities for us in the future to yeah, we, do something special. You know, Dale's a pretty good idea guy, and he said a. Uh, sent me a, or talked with me about a pretty creative idea with that performing arts center we'll talk more down the road i think we got our hands in one big one right now but yeah that's going to be a neat facility that we can do some great things i think down the road with bus and do some things differently than we're presently doing i think the other pieces that i, I would add here um is is I'm, I'm, we have to secure a little bit of funding for the outdoor learning spaces that wasn't part of the bid and so i think dale's backing off on saying too much about it but potentially if we get some funding and we can work on this um, there's much more in those outdoor learning studios than you could ever imagine you know we're gonna have a bot zone potentially where they the, one of the the fifth grade level am I touching on your presentation Brian at all uh, fifth grade level uh, um, is programming 
and so they'll be programming your robots. They'll have a bot zone where they can actually do that work. Um, the roof water will drain into potentially a stream in the sidewalk that feeds part of that bioswale. Uh, we'll have cisterns that collect water so we can use them to go for outside gardens for the learning and gardening se sessions. Um, three or four boxes potentially of boulders in one and mud in another one and sand in another for, for learning teaching tools. There's a lot going on out here um, that we've come up with and again the building is designed with curriculum which isn't often that happens. So, um, One of the things that we talk to the community a lot about and we anticipate is with the demographics of this area of town and the community center before and after school programs expecting quite a bit of pedestrian traffic I, I would term it quite a bit of pedestrian traffic between this facility and the community center down further down Collins. Uh, have you given thought uh, to that tr flow back to the building and from the building? Lines up well. Yeah, um, there were representatives from the community center that were part of the um, planning groups, and so we did uh, recognize that there would be uh, that you know, relationship between the two facilities. Uh, and we know that there's going to either be traffic between the buildings, both pedestrian and, uh, and but also talk a, a, a little bit about uh, what may currently be housed in the community center um, due to space restrictions. Some of those activities may now uh, shift over and be within the footprint of the uh, school okay. and that they may use areas like the gym uh, and cafeteria spaces and even the gateway commons area up here within the footprint of the building for some of the before and after school programs. How about, how about the foot traffic flow? You know, I, I, I've, I'm trying to and imagine. All the sidewalks that allow uh, people to walk down Collins are here, but then there would be uh, sidewalks that connect through and into the back of the school. Okay, here. I can see that connection mm -hmm. now. Okay. So yeah, the, their initial talks were maybe programming in the building versus out of the program building, and and I don't know if you have anything very well to show this yet, but um, that gateway commons area fits well into the media center. They they will be able the ability to open to each other as well as one large learning space as well. Yes. So we see activity and learning going on in the gateway commons as well as your media center. It'll be all opened up. We, we, we kind of, Brian might be, when he gets up there, he has a drawing <coughs> from Dale, one of the early ones of the media center, where you'll see that being a, that, in fact, we hardly touched on that, but that's not yeah. your typical media center. We almost no. should take the name media center away. Yeah, really, uh, the media center, we're, we're, it'll still have the elements of a media center within it, but the makerspace and STEM studio concepts will also overlay and apply to that. And as Mike said, it will, open up to be a partition to this gateway commons area. So you can see just by relative size that that combined space is actually larger than the cafeteria or the gym. So there's another opportunity for a fairly large um, gathering space within the footprint of the building. Really you have you know, the three large ones and then even by themselves the STEM studio and maker space are not, not tiny spaces. So a lot of, uh, and one of the things we talked about um, is that um, just how you schedule lunch, how students flow uh, in and out of the building, <clears throat> when and where, you know, you, you, the path you choose to get to and from recess will kind of stretch beyond what um, you're used to because of the, the number of students that will be in this building. Um, you kind of, it'll graduate to maybe a different level of thinking in some ways. And uh, I know that the, um, the principals that were involved in the planning sessions have already started to, you know, think, okay, what's, what's it going to really mean when you go from like 400 or 500 to seven, 750 students in an elementary school? So yeah, this, okay. Oh, I was just going to ask a quick question. At first, it, this is just amazing. It's so exciting. But um, when I see that plan, what about the rooms for specials, like art, music, all there. Spanish? Um, yeah, okay. Uh, and I, I, I didn't go into detail on many of those things, and so thank you for asking. I can, so 
so basically, um, this hallway that leads down to the cafeteria and gym space, uh, we were able to uh, utilize part of what was cafeteria for the language classroom, and then art and music, uh, kind of the, the noisy uh, room in, in the mix. It, it is intentionally isolated, but also has a nice relationship and proximity to the cafeteria and the stage area. And actually, we're able to create this little like mini uh, riser area because of the great difference between the two. If you're not familiar with the, the gym floor and media center floor, are about a foot and a half different elevations. So we, we have a great change within the building that we have to deal with. So we're just kind of leveraging that. And, and literally outside of the music classroom, there will be a similar riser configuration to what they would um, perform on, they'll be able to practice on right there outside the music. Room. So, and then the art room is in the corner here, strategically placed with two walls for outside windows and things like that. So lots of natural light in there. Um, and then the special ed classrooms will be, uh, this hallway off of Main Street is where um, the special ed classrooms are. And along the way here, there are many other miscellaneous spaces, um, resource rooms, strategically placed, dispersed throughout the, the building. Just a couple, one other thing I might highlight, uh, in the K through two classrooms, uh, the toilet rooms and, and cubbies, uh, locker, little cubby areas for each student are in the classroom. When we get to the upper L, three, four, five, uh, the, the toilet rooms and locker areas move out into the corridor. Well, we'll uh, stop with Dale because for time constraints and what we have Brian coming up and he's going to present the rest of our MPS strategic STEM plan because this was just the STEM school which is going to incubate eventually into the five other remaining elementary schools and into the middle school and high school for a complete STEM strategic plan and so thank you Dale for that presentation. <clears throat> I think it's uh, pertinent to start off that this is uh, something that I, I couldn't be more excited to be a part of. This really is a once-in-a-career opportunity that, that you have the ability to um, be blessed with a bond proposal where it can improve facilities, but use those facilities to create a special opportunity to help uh, realize the academic outcomes that, that we want as well, too. And so um, I, I need to start with thanks to many people. This really has been a year and a half in the making. Um, it all really started with, with a lunch meeting after the bond passed, and we'll give the original idea to, to Mr. Cooper, where we sat there and said, you know, we're, we're going to make a new elementary school. There's something special that we can do with this. Why, why don't we theme it? And we, we can theme this into a STEM elementary. And from there, we've spent a year and a half creating from that little sticky note um, into a 10-year MPS STEM strategic plan. And so what we're going to go into here is um, I, I'm going to leave a, a lot of the, the glory of the STEM elementary with Dale because he deserves a lot of the credit. And, and I'm going to focus more on the overall STEM strategic plan, plan for all of Midland Public Schools. Dale touched on it briefly earlier um, that some of the design elements of the STEM elementary will help us incubate the spread into the other elementaries. Um, but we are also going to be transforming some of our curricular offerings um, at our middle school and high school levels as well, too. And so the, the stars really did align for us to help meet some of the pillars of, of our mission statement. One, again, the, the generosity of the voters of passing the bond was critical. But two, at the same time, um, research had become prevalent and our community business partners, universities, um, th this idea of STEM is not one of those buzzwords in education that's going to go away in 60, 90, 180 days like we're used to. Th this is here to stay. This is something that research is telling us is not going away. And the more educational research that's done, the more that we feel it's going to help us realize our academic outcomes. Um, research is telling us that random acts of STEM by themselves have marginal effect on achievement gaps, have marginal effect on improvement in your soft tech skills, in your mathematics skills, and also in your science skills. But if you can put these together in a correlated and vertically aligned fashion, it can help you realize some very, very powerful, measurable outcomes. 
And so a lot of research went into the development of this plan. This wasn't something that we just pulled off of that sticky note. We did start with my favorite slide, three, three boards of sitting down and pulling some of the best minds we could together and throwing all of our ideas out. But there were many, many hours and late nights of, of getting on the internet and calling colleagues and, and respected professionals and saying, is there something to this? Is the research telling us that we're going to realize our, our academic outcomes? And so from the sticky note came this, our, our MPS STEM strategic plan. Don't worry, I, I know you can't see it right very well right now, but I am going to zoom in for you um, and show you some of the different components of the STEM strategic plan. Again, I, I can't reiterate enough that the stars really have a line for us here to pull off something special. Not only internally um, were we blessed with the bond, but at the same time, the, the exterior four components that you see on our STEM strategic plan um, are going to help us form reciprocal partnerships that will help us pull off what we believe can't be done just by ourselves. We know that we have amazing educators, we know that we have amazing administrators, but it truly will take the community, it truly will take our business partners, and it will take our post-secondary partners as well to be able to realize the academic gains that we are desiring. So on the exterior of our STEM strategic plan, it's important to note um, that up in the upper right-hand corner are Great Lakes Bay Regional STEM Networks. This was formulated from a study that was commissioned um, by Dow um, as a way to actually put onto paper the challenges in the Great Lakes Bay region to be able to form a pipeline of STEM-related talent into our area. Uh, we know that the business community demands people with these skill set, and so they commissioned a study that has then came out in four actionable forms. There's networks at four local universities, Delta, Mid-Michigan, Central, and Saginaw Valley, that are working on actions from that study. We're partners with all four of those entities, and they are very close to rolling out um, math initiatives. They're rolling out career-related initiatives as well, too. It only makes sense that we're going to develop reciprocal partnerships with them to help embed whatever we can into our own STEM strategic plan and help them along the way as well, too. Other exciting opportunities. Uh, you may have read the press release that Michigan State University is going to become more prevalent in our area with the opening of the STEM Center for Excellence and the old MMI building. We've met a few times with our partners from Michigan State. We are in the beginning stages of, of um, formalizing that partnership. We hope that this morphs into some curriculum help, some training help, and we also selfishly hope that this turns into a pipeline of talent where we are utilizing some of their pre-service teachers to assist us in our STEM Studios makerspaces, exposing them to the Midland Community Schools uh, Midland Public Schools, and also having them eventually want to work in our schools as well, too. Um, we also would be remiss if we didn't mention our work with Saginaw Valley State as well. They've been integral partners in helping us to this point. We've um, actually invited them to attend trips with us to research um, design of the building, and they'll be partnering with us in some of the training that we're doing this summer. And I don't think we could even go any further in this plan without mentioning the beautiful opportunities and um, ways that we can partner with our business community, Dow, Dow Corning, and some of the other um, resources that we have in this area. We know that these are natural partnerships, and we know that as we formalize some of the volunteers from these organizations, it will help us, again, in, in realize some of the academic gains that we want to. So on the exterior of our STEM strategic plan, we have a multitude of resources to be able to help us pull this off. Um, and we think that without their help that we would have great difficulty in accomplishing what are some of our measurable outcomes are. So uh, I'm going to walk you through this now and take you into the interior parts of our strategic plan, first starting with the elementary schools as well. Um, there's lots of colors that will be coming at you here. A lot of these colors are for us internally to know what we've already got going for us, um, what is in concept, and what was, was in our dream stage as well to be able to make this happen. You just heard a, a presentation about our amazing STEM elementary that's going to be happening. Um, this elementary, we think, is going to be the incubator for the rollout of our STEM strategic plan at all of our other elementary schools as well, too. The components of the STEM elementary and the training that these instructors receive will help us roll out um, the methods and the practices and the curriculum into the other buildings as well, too. 
So for each of these components of the STEM plan, I'll, I'll show you the big graphic, and then I'll, I'll zoom a little bit more and, and do some details into what is going to be happening specifically in the buildings. Um, I've color-coded even further um, because with the plan also comes the question of sustainability, and I think that's something that we need to address right off the bat. And it's important to note that there's going to be multiple funding streams that will be assisting us in pulling off this plan as well, too. So when it comes to the color coding of the actual text of the text on the screen, if it's in red, this is where we're seeking potential external support from local family foundations. Blue is things that are going to be supported by the bond, and green are commitments of our general fund that we believe um, will help us throughout the STEM strategic plan. Um, Dale briefly mentioned this, but uh, one of the cornerstones of all of the levels with the integration of the strategic plan is going to be the utilization of the Project Lead the Way curriculum. The Project Lead the Way curriculum, I think it's important to note, is not going to replace our current science curriculum entirely. It, we, we've been doing lots of crosswalks, and um, for those that don't know, that the state has recently adopted a new set of science standards, the next generation science standards. Um, and so we are going to align the Project Lead the Way curriculum with those science standards. And right now, we're at about a 55, 60% correlation. So the Project Lead the Way curriculum is going to supplement our current science offerings, not replace it entirely. But what the Project Lead the Way curriculum does for us is it takes science out of isolation. And it integrates technology skills. It integrates a project-based approach. And it also integrates mathematics components as well, too. And so in all of the elementaries, we're going to be integrating this Project Lead the Way curriculum that is module-based. Some of the elements Dale mentioned to it, but every single level has their different modules. And I'm going to show you in a slide here what some of these sample Project Lead the Way units would look like. And uh, the one that's been my favorite to emphasize for people, when you're looking at the top and it says animals and algorithms, this is a kindergarten Project Lead the Way unit. And if you take just a, a second to read through this, um, what it basically is saying, it's introducing kindergartners to the basics of computer programming, um, utilizing nature-related algorithms. That's even a mouthful for me to say. And you say, how, how can kindergartners pull this off? Well, this is through app-based learning. Um, Project Lead the Way utilizes the iPad and those apps um, to be able to help students generate these skills. And the curriculum will build on itself grade after grade. And there is a vertical sequence that hopefully will spur their interest into STEM-related subjects from the elementary into the middle school, into the high school as well, too. So our hope is that through doing innovative units such as animals and algorithms, that students will hopefully find a niche, find a passion. And if they do develop that passion, they have the opportunity to pursue that deeper in the middle school and even deeper in the high school as well, too. Um, I also want to point out real quick, and I, I, I copied this one for you. If you see the first grade where it says light observing the sun, the moon, the stars, that just kind of drives in the point. If you can remember back to some of Dale's pictures where he showed you the solar system that was embedded into the cement. All of these, they're correlated to the curriculum, the different elements that he put in. So going back a few slides, not only are we going to embed the Project Lead the Way curriculum, but we're going to use this building to facilitate the curriculum as a learning tool. Mr. Sherrill touched on it, and I, I didn't put the fancy pictures of the robot crash zone in there for you. But in, in another slide, you'll see a fifth grade Project Lead the Way unit where they are going to be programming robots. And there will be an outdoor zone for them to test those robots, boulders to go around, ramps to go up, obstacles to go around as well, too. So the really fun part of designing this building was being able to have it assist and engage students into the curriculum so the curriculum isn't something that's just learned sitting behind a desk. The building will immerse them into that curriculum as well, too. Um, you can't talk about a STEM strategic plan without the, the T of it, the technology. Um, we are planning on having one-to-one -one devices in this STEM elementary school. Right now, it looks like that may be iPads. Um, we know that that is the fall of 2017, and the board knows that in the world of technology, it could be a device that we don't even know of yet. Um, 
but one-to-one -one technology is critical to pulling off the Project Lead the Way curriculum at the elementary level. And we plan by 2018-19 to have one-to-one -one devices in all of the elementary schools as well, too. Um, the very bottom point, I talked briefly before about using, utilizing this building as a practicum partner. Um, what a great opportunity for pre-service teachers and for some of our local volunteers to be in here and to be learning with, uh, with our students and being able to assist in these hands-on project-based activities. So the partnerships with Michigan State, with Saginaw Valley, with the limitless post-secondary partners that we believe can team, we know is going to add merit and add benefit to what we're trying to pull off. Um, very important point that I want to drive home for you here. We, when we do the ribbon cutting and when we actually pull off the opening of the STEM elementary school, which seems like far away, but for us that are planning and trying to train, it really is kind of scary for us how, how fast it's coming. This will be the incubator and this will be the spread for us um, to all of the other elementary schools. So when we train this summer, we are going to be training teachers from all of the elementary schools, not just the MPS STEM elementary school. So what we learn from that training, what we learn from the building design, and what we learn from that first year at the STEM elementary thank you, is also going to assist us um, in the spread of this to the other elementaries as well too. Um, we, we touched on the partnership with uh, external partners as well too. We think that our relationship with the community center is going to evolve and it's going to flourish We've had lots of conversations with uh, some of the management. Kevin's been great to work with us. And we're looking at transforming before and after care and after activities um, from, lack of a better term, from babysitting activities into STEM immerse experiences um, where we can provide robotics activities for students, where we can provide project-based um, activities for students. And when they are utilizing the aftercare provided by the community center, that this can be a learning opportunity for them as well, too. I already showed you this one. Um, this is the fifth grade units that I was talking about for Project Lead the Way launch. And you can see that um, in the robotics and automation challenge by fifth grade, students will be programming robots. And the design elements of the building will allow them the space to be able to do that, and the space also to be able to test them out, and to be able to play with them, and, and to be able to put them through the exercises that we know will um, engage them and make them excited. Um, I also put this one up here because there's a sequential tie-in to this. If, if you look at the next units, infection detection and infection modeling and simulation, this is where students are starting to be exposed to some of the biomedical sciences as well. And we know in the STEM fields that really the fastest growing area is the healthcare industry as well. So students at the elementary levels are going to be introduced to modules in that field. And you'll see that at the middle schools, as we progress, that the Project Lead the Way Gateway curriculum has units to them, one being medical detectives, where they can pursue elective choices that can help them spur and deepen their interest. So shifting the focus of this plan into the middle schools, we are planning on adopting the Project Lead the Way Gateway curriculum as well, too. It's important to note that the, the curriculum really kind of shifts itself as you go into levels module based in the elementaries and really very elective based when it comes to the middle schools. Um, we, we would be remiss if we would say that we haven't heard loud and clear from colleagues from research that middle school really can be kind of the forgotten area in, in education. A lot of emphasis goes on elementary and high school has such a plethora of choices. What, what are we doing at the middle school level to be able to take some of that enthusiasm that we are going to definitely garner at the elementary age and to be able to foster that and hopefully grow that into a pathway into the high school as well too. So what we're planning on doing is embedding the curriculum of Project Lead the Gateway as elective opportunities for our students. And these elective opportunities correlate to the modules at the elementary level and also then will vertically align to the different programs that will be ingrained at the high school level as well too. So students will have the ability to go from an engaging elementary STEM curriculum, have choices to refine that STEM elementary or that STEM middle school interest, and then specialize once they get to the high school level, which will again hopefully help us achieve some of our measurable outcomes 
of having students increase STEM majors, enroll in the post-secondary education, educational settings um, in those STEM demand fields that we know are so popular. Um, so at the middle schools, the ingraining of the project Lead the Way curriculum, um, we want to formalize our robotics teams at the middle school. Uh, we know that a lot of the barrier to robotics is that it is after school. Um, we'd like to move some of that into the school day so students that have barriers of transportation are not um, blocked from participating in these challenges. Um, the technology enabled instruction and interventions is something that is in place now but building as we speak. We were blessed to be able to put one-to-one -one devices into our middle school this year. Every single middle school student has a laptop um, and that is helping us provide a technology enhanced um, instructional environment. And we'd be remiss if we didn't mention that we are in process right now revising our entire science curriculum at the middle school level in partnership with Michigan Tech University as a part of a grant um, from the HH and Grace A. Dow Foundation that is moving it to a project-based theme rather than teaching subjects in isolation. So a revised middle school science curriculum enhanced by technology-enabled interventions and an ingrainment of an elective offering that is STEM-rich, that's aligned to the K-5 curriculum and will serve as an incubator to our high school curriculum as well, too. Um, the high school spoke gets a little bit more involved because high schools by nature are a little bit more involved. Um, but one of the main components that you see in orange that was in concept for us is the ingraining of the Project Lead the Way curriculum. You've heard me mention um, health-based um, course offerings and curriculum, and you'll see that there's a biomedical program that will be ingrained. Um, you've heard me talk about computer programming and technology, and you can see that there's a computer science-based program. And one of the components that um, is going to be integrated as well, too, is an engineering-based program as well, which can help conceptualize and put together some of the mathematics components and bring in some of the science and physics components as well. So where it was module-based in the elementary and then extra um, elective-based in the middle schools, in the high schools, the Project Lead the Way is more programmatic-based, whereas when you enroll into the biomedical program, there's a series of courses that will take you through that pathway to get you um, into that realm of certification um, for the end. And so ingraining the Project Lead the Way curriculum is a major component. But we feel, again, that just that in isolation will not be part of a good, strong, well-rounded STEM strategic plan. And so we are planning on ingraining technology-enabled instructional interventions. Next year, we plan to roll out our devices at the high school, um, specific device to be determined at this point in time. But we know that putting that device in their hand will help open up a world of opportunity to our students and to our instructors as well, too. Um, we can't proceed to this plan without mentioning our CTE programs. We have a, a very, very, very deep, strong tradition of, of exemplary CTE programs. And we know that taking those CTE programs to the next level, to STEM-based CTE programs, those additions, will help us enhance um, the skill sets that some students may need. Uh, some people don't view welding as a STEM job, but it is. Um, and some people will think that the isolation of the medical program that we have right now is not tied into the other core component areas that they are. So taking our CTE programs, embedding them um, into the STEM strategic plan with ties into our IB, Dipro IB diploma program as well too, all makes sense when it comes to realizing the academic outcomes that we're trying to achieve. So pulling all of this off is going to be a challenge. And as I said before, it is going to take the community. It is going to take our post-secondary partners to be able to do this as well, too. Um, I mentioned that we are a bit nervous about the timeline because there's so much to do in so little time. Every single one of those components and spokes that you saw within the graphics all have separate timelines to them as well. There's a lot of different balls that are rolling downhill right now. and all of it has to be ready to go for component one in, in the fall of 2017. So as we sit right now in the winter of 2015, you've seen the fences, they're up um, around central campus and we're starting the construction um, in the spring, 
right now, um, we are going to be announcing leadership for the STEM elementary soon. We are going to be doing presentations to both the Carpenter and East Lawn staff on February 1 and February 2 to introduce them deeper to the concepts that we're presenting to you tonight to see if they want to opt in to teaching in the building. Um, and then we'll be presenting to other staff members as well too in other elementaries to see if they'd like to be an opportunity in this building as well. And uh, I know that uh, Mr. Dombro has said this several times that he said the, the easy part is building the building. The hard part is getting the teachers to utilize the building the proper way. So we aren't waiting um, a year. We're not even waiting um, a year and a half to be able to get training started. We'll be starting training this summer and we will be training on site in these rooms where we're bringing in um, Project Lead the Way to train our trainers and we'll be utilizing this space and the technology in it to be able to get our trainers established so that they can help train our elementary instructors for the STEM building next school year so they can be ready to go in the fall of 2017. In sync with that happening, we have a lot of work to do for training for our middle school staff that's going to be teaching some of the electives I showed you. And we have training that has to be going on throughout that time with our high school staff as well too to be able to utilize the devices that we're ingraining and also to be able to instruct in the elective offerings and the programs that I showed you at the high school as well, too. So lots of balls, lots of spokes, lots of moving pieces to this, but it's our end goal that by the 2018-19 school year, every single one of those graphics in there will be colorized, that they are now in process and established, and we can start realizing some of the academic benefits that we put in place as the measurable outcomes for our entire STEM school. I know that was a mouthful, um, and I know that there's a lot of moving components there, probably lots of questions. Um, there are eight, nine, ten different versions of this presentation, and there are probably 25, 30 different timelines, and hundreds and hundreds of pages of research, and hundreds and hundreds of man hours behind each and every one of these concepts. So uh, again, what a blessing for us here in the Midland Public Schools to be able to be at the right place in the right time and have the components to be able to pull off a, a strategic plan of this nature. We think that um, once ingrained with fidelity, that the outcomes um, from academic gains to the narrowing of the achievement gap to the increase of students um, enrolling in post-secondary STEM majors is going to be something that is going to be an envy of the region and also the nation as well. So at this point, uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to I'd add, um, um, as you well aware, are aware of, that we secured a large amount of funding to implement the STEM strategic plan, but that press release is being written by the foundations and will be released by them, and so until that time, we're, we're not really releasing that dollar amount or who that is. It was colorized as red for potential support. So we, we've been working for quite a while with the foundations. Brian, you may have answered my first question in your very last question. Um, metrics. Yes, sir. Um, you know, we'll, we'll always have the gaps and the metrics that are forced upon us that sure. you know, are semi valid to understand where our kids in general yep. are going. You mentioned one that uh, how do we know we've actually increased the pipeline of people that go into STEM related fields, all the way sure. from medicine to engineering to whatever, sure. you know, nursing, lab techs, whatever. How do we begin to measure that down the road? Mm -hmm. Once people have left us, how do we? How we do actually we completed the <laughs> just. Just it, it's so. great, and, and I think one of the, the benefits of the way this plan has evolved over time, again, from the sticky note to, to what you're seeing today, has been the interaction with the family foundations and some of our business partners and some of our corporate partners as well, too. And every single one of them asked her the exact same question that you did. What are the metrics, and how are you going to prove that this is working? Some of the metrics were very good here in public schools at identifying achievement gaps, proficiency scales, et cetera. But when it comes to some of the softer metrics, such as interest in, um, we had to think long and hard about how we're going to do that. Um, and so we're starting this year with baseline surveys of interest levels of our current seniors going into. And we're also working with um, some of our data partners to be able to track into the post-secondary world that will tell us the success rates of these students in those programs. Not just that they went into, but what their success rates were retention two and four years into these programs. It can be done. People just haven't asked. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, we have been working hard over the past three months 
to be able to put those metrics on paper. We have everything on paper now as a baseline metric. We're tracking it, so by the time that 2018-19 comes around, and we think we'll start realizing the gains in this, we'll have a three-year baseline data set to compare back to. And I think it's important to note that we fully anticipate that the longer this goes, the greater our achievement gains will be. As we finally, and, and I hope I'm still around when this happens, when that kindergartner finally gets all the way through and 13 years beyond, that's when you can really take a look at the numbers and say, well, did this entire plan work? So we have our baseline metrics now. We're going to be tracking to have a, a good basal set for when 18, 19 comes around. And when it does, we, we have the data sheets and Excel sheets ready to go to be able to track into the future. And hopefully, each and every single year and cohort that goes through, our realized gains increase each and every single year. That's a comment. Um, I'm excited. As you know, I'm not a software, I'm an engineer, and I work with the engineering university and stuff. But this is. If anything, we can do to shake up the status quo of continuum. And our team is pretty good, but we have our achievement gaps, and we have these other areas. This is the type of thing we need to do. And I'm, I'm boldly excited. I liked your one comment. I don't think it's just going to be an example for the region. I think I hope we become an example for the state and the nation yeah. of how to do this. Are there any other comments? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very That's much. Great. Overwhelmed. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> So we feel oh, like we're doing justice right now. Patrick said it's overwhelming. We, f we have felt that feeling multiple times through this process. So. Oh, it's, it is so exciting. It is very exciting. And to think it all starts with outcomes and how students are, uh, <coughs> what <coughs> students can achieve. And, <coughs> go, and then looking <coughs> under every stone and making sure everything's set up for the success of the students. That, that's what excites me. So many times it seems like we've ha we have programs in my whole lifetime where you really focus on one area, this area, and then next year, this area, and then. Yep. But this is the whole shebang. And uh, the impact potential of that is really exciting. So thanks for your presentation. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, where are we? It's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> On five, Pam, Board five, of Education, board of education matters. matters. Oh, the poor Northwood guys are still yes. sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> Prices went up. Okay, we are yeah. on item 5.2. Well, 5.1. But we can jump the 5.2. Yeah. Oh. Well, go ahead. Why don't we do the 5.2, Pam, and come back. Can we, can we jump yes. on there? Okay, so uh, item 5.2, we have Northwood University's purchase agreement for parcel of land at the back of H.H. H. Dow High School property. Uh, Mr. Sherrill, could you? As you know, I think certainly the FFO members are aware. We've been working through this. I've informed you all for quite some time. I don't know, Keith, would you contact me nearly a year ago or nine months ago? And so we've been working on this for a while and talking. <coughs> and um, you know, make sure we've turned every stone. You know, Jerry and I met with Northwood. We went out and actually walked the property. Um, Northwood's done the bulk of the research behind the sale of that, and um, we're ready to make that agreement. And I sent that to you um, with, with the price and um, ready to take action. Keith's ready to sign his dotted line, and I'll sign for you <laughs> once you take action. <coughs> if you have questions on Northwood, they are here tonight for any questions you might have. Okay, well, I feel like I should ask you a question. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have designs yet for the, for the dorm buildings you're going to put in the space, Keith? Uh, we have we have an architect that's uh, we've had for a while that is working on the final design activities, and uh, we should have those probably in the next 60 days. Uh, our hope is to have the new housing at least two of the four buildings. There'll be four buildings uh, each with about 80 beds of housing. Um, two of those buildings we'd like to be able to occupy for the fall of 17. So we need to move ahead uh, rapidly. Thanks. Yep. get this done then. There you go. <laughs> Are there any other uh, questions or discussion? I'd entertain a motion to... I will move that we proceed with the purchase agreement uh, with Northwood University. I will support. Very good. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, looks like... Uh, Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>
<laughs> We've it, took you, it took you an hour to get to it, but. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting. <laughs> 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 Always been good partners back and forth, yeah. and I'm sure that will continue. So, thank you guys. It was thank you. It'll be fun to watch and see what happens there. Make it look pretty. <laughs> <laughs> well, just out of curiosity, are these uh, supposed to replace existing dorms, or will they be additional? Uh, it's actually a little bit of both. Okay. Um, we have uh, one housing set of housing units called our South Village um, that are kind of in a, a low point with the flood plain that have been there that have outlived their useful life. Um, oh, okay. So we want to build this to uh, replace a bunch of those. beds okay. there, but also we are adding uh, a number of beds and we're also going to utilize that first two buildings and uh, the 160 beds that will come online there to take our residence halls in Minor and Du Bois um, uh, um, take portions of those halls offline to redo them over the course of the okay. next three years um, so that they can be modernized and, and uh, uh, appropriate for today's world. Okay. All Thank, right. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, we'll go move into item 5.1. Uh, in November of 2015, the Office of Civil Rights came to Midland Public Schools and completed an audit for our career and technical education programs. During that audit, the OCR found three relatively small findings that have been addressed in the compliance plan and for which board approval is uh, requested. It, it, and I'll add that um, when they came to us, it was just simply luck of draw. We've never been drawn, and, and there was no issues that brought them here. And when we say three relatively small uh, findings, traditionally the findings are 15 or more in nature. And when I say small, it was signage somewhere and those type of items. And so we are, um, we do have to turn in tomorrow a corrective action plan, which we've uh, finished after our last board meeting with the holidays, and we were done. But it was. We need you to take action tonight so we can turn those in. I would entertain a motion to uh, start that process. I move adaptation of the corrective actions as specified in 5.1. I'll support that. Okay, we'll move into a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, let the record show it's unanimous. And now we have uh, item six, the curriculum and instruction and an assessment. Uh, we don't have a study committee minutes, but we do have a major change proposal for action. Shall I go through this? Or no, that'll be like Brian. Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, we, we brought these four major change proposals to you at the last board meeting for information. Um, a very brief summation. There's four changes. One includes the addition of Math Lab 8, which is a, a course designed to assist students that are struggling in their regular mathematics course. Um, two changes to science. One to the survey of biology, dropping the name of survey. Um, we've got a lot of feedback from parents and staff. The connotation that comes with the term survey is viewed negatively, and so we moved to remove that title. Um, the same with physics. Um, deleting the point two survey of physics offering, and so we will only remain with a point two physics offering. And then a change to uh, world language courses, French one and German one. Um, this does not create a new course, but what it does is allows the teacher to differentiate with, within the course so they can offer it at a point two or point three level within it, which the world language instructors were um, pushing very hard to put it on a level playing field um, with some of our other world language offerings as well, too. The, the support for these um, proposals has been very strong from a teacher standpoint and administrative standpoint, and we feel that they're moving in the right direction to help us uh, enhance our course offerings and increase rigor and also provide some support to students that are struggling as well, too. Excellent. I move adaptation of uh, 6.1. Support. support. Okay, any discussion? Nope, nope, looks good. So it looks like when you drop the, the survey of for biology and survey of for physics, that's kind of uh, one piece is dropping the name, the other is uh, increasing rigor? Correct. Okay, very good. All right, we'll move into vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Let the record show it's unanimous. 
We will move into uh, item seven, which is uh, finance facilities and operations. We did have a uh, FFO meeting, and I will read the minutes for that. The meeting was January 11th. Myself, Angela Branstad, uh, Mr. Shero, and Mr. Cooper were present, along with guest, guest Daryl Dumbrow from Barton Mallow and Dale Jerome from French Associates. Mr. Cooper reviewed the uh, November financials as well as budget adjustments that will be scheduled for the February Board of Education meeting. January 1st, conversion of the new high deductible health plan with an HSA and the purchase agreement of Midland Public School property by Northwood University, and that we voted on tonight. We had a bond update where uh, Barton Mallow reviewed the progress and timelines on the current bond projects. We had final cost estimates for the STEM elementary before the project goes out for bid. Uh, the tentative timeline on the bid process is as follows. January 14th, the projects go out for bid. February 11th, the bids are due. February 18th will be an update at the FFO meeting. And February 22nd, uh, presented at Board of Education uh, meeting for approval. Mr. Jerome from French Associates provided an update on the STEM elementary school, including portions of a presentation with building renderings, and we saw a lot of those tonight. Uh, in initial stakeholder input meetings were held for the Performing Arts Center renovation in, um, on January 5th, and the next FFO meeting will be February 18th. Okay, and Mr. Wasserman is our new chair for that yes. FFO, so we'll <laughs> be reading our minutes in the future. Uh, item 7.2 for information. Uh, do we have Excuse donations? <coughs> um, I have two pieces of information for you tonight. The first one is a donation of an item, a clarinet, and 7.3 is actually 18 different items for a grand total of $15,946. And 30 cents. It's quite a range. So after the last few meetings, but we're getting lots of donations, which are good things. We're going to try at the end of the televised meetings to now start running all those people's and the gifts, oh, uh, thanking the donors oh, uh, at idea. the end. So okay. uh, that would be better than me hitting and missing. And yep. the list gets long sometime, and I wouldn't want to miss anybody when we're doing that. So we're going to try to do that at the end of every board meeting now. Um, of course, once in a while you'll have some traction because of the size of them, but Tonight it's just all information that you can see. It's a wide range from elementary to the high schools, uh, for boosters, clubs, to parent advisories, music groups, and just uh, people, individuals that are uh, donating to various projects depending on the, the school we're looking at. So there's a, a good list there. Very good. We don't have to take action on any of those. It's just for information. Uh, item eight for human resources. That would be me. And so as you can tell, we're getting um, a large list of retirees and that list will grow and we'll um, hopefully know all of our retirees by the end of the month. And um, I do feel I need to mention their names here. If someone put as many years of service in as they have, they should be recognized. So, so Mr. William Brown, social worker from the special services department, Mr. Mark Camilleri, biology teacher from Midland High, Ms. Catherine Dusso, special education teacher, Jefferson Middle School, Mr. John English, Mr. John English, English teacher from Midland High School, <laughs> Ms. Christina, Christina Jacobs, Spanish teacher, Woodcrest Elementary, Ms. Bonita Johnstone, science teacher, Midland High School, Ms. Brenda McKenna, kindergarten teacher, East Lawn Elementary School, Ms. Linda Murray, music education teacher, music department, Ms. Rebecca Showalter, special education teacher, juvenile care center, Ms. Deborah Smith, sixth grade teacher, Jefferson Middle School. Mr. Larry Tim, special education teacher, Jefferson Middle School. Ms. Sue Trahan, eighth grade science teacher, Northeast Middle School. Ms. Janet Wolner, music education teacher, East Lawn and Chestnut Hill. Ms. Rihanna Yule, fourth grade teacher, Chestnut Hill Elementary. As we said, with the incentive out there, it's going to get quite large, and so we'll recognize those tonight. Um, we do have. Uh, uh, where we need to extend our sympathy 
to the family of Mr. William Fitzgibbon, who passed away on January 2nd, 2016. Mr. Fitzgibbon was a special education teacher at Dow High and State Street, retiring in 1981 after 22 years of service. Mr. Fitzgibbon received the Gerstacker Teacher Proficiency Award in 1964. Wow. <clears throat> Thank you, a lot of uh, great educators and um, Always sad to see yep. folks move on. We'll be out recruiting soon for all the replacements. <laughs> okay, item nine is correspondence to and from the board. We have uh, for information letters from the Board of Education or the school system to uh, several different um, people who have donated uh, to the schools. And 9.2, we have four information letters to the Board of Education from a FOIA request. Then uh, item 10, scheduled activities for the future. We have uh, 13 board meetings in the coming year, I guess 12 if we don't count this one today. And we'll move into item 11, study discussion session. And I'll start over with Yvonne if I could. Okay, I just wanted to say thank you uh, to the gentleman from French and Associates. That was a wonderful presentation. Very, very exciting. It's so exciting to see this not only start happening, but really moving along rapidly. And of course, we owe a real big thank you to the people of our community because if it weren't for them, we wouldn't be doing this. So, um, big thanks to all of them. Um, congratulations to our shining stars. Thanks for their service to MPS. A big thank you to our donors. We're so fortunate to have so many wonderful donations every meeting. And a special congratulations and a big thank you to our retirees. I recognize a lot of those names. I had personal experience with a lot of those people over the years. They were awesome, wonderful teachers. They gave a lot to uh, Midland Public Schools and we owe them a lot. So thank you so much. That's it. Okay, um, I've got a whole page of notes that I wanted to talk about in the, on this, the STEM program, uh, but I'll, I'll withhold those comments until we get things more cemented, and, and a lot of it were things that were touched on by other members, so uh, in the interest of time, there's no need to repeat all that. I uh, just want to congratulate Sharon and Kimberly on, on their shining stars and their excellent service uh, to our district and to our students. Um, to, to again, as I do every meeting, thank our donors uh, for being so generous and our, our foundations and our uh, booster clubs for, for doing such a wonderful job uh, raising money for, for items that our, our children need to further their education. Um, beyond that, uh, again, just a page full of awesome STEM notes, but uh, we'll talk about that next time. Can I add one more thing? I just wanted to thank Mrs. Jacobs, Ms. Jacobs' class for these wonderful mm -hmm. cards. These are great. I look forward to these every year. They're so nice. Thank you, students. Okay. I also congratulate Sharon and uh, Kimberly as our shining stars. I've known Sharon for many, many years, and uh, so um, I personally, and I know how dedicated she is, and I, and Kimberly as well. And uh, we can't do. Um, our job very well without all our teachers as well that they are uh, our pair pros and our other people support so so many retirees and like Yvonne many of those teachers my kids have had and and we've been blessed with uh, their talents and and um, guiding our students to be successful uh, I love the presentation I've been so excited to see the the stem school and and uh, um, see what's progressing so far and just makes me wish I was younger and I had kids that could uh, to go there. So I, I will be looking forward to seeing the rest of the presentations. Um, and it, it's School Board Appreciation Month, as, as Mike said, and it's, it's such a pleasure and an honor to be on the board for Midland Public Schools and, and to work with all of you and the administrators, schools, staff, community, parents, and students. So thank you. Uh, Thank you for the recognition through these books. I am, I'm really excited to look through them, and I know she is, uh, her movie is going to be here this weekend at the Center for the Arts, and um, I'm anxious to see that. She's an incredible, incredible young woman that supports education. Mo mostly we hear about for women, but for education in general. So thank you, it'll be a pleasure to drop those off at the schools. And uh, 
to the MCEA also for your generous donation in our name to support students uh, in the scholarship program. And lastly, I went out um, Sorry, the, I'm having trouble with the, <laughs> <laughs> the other day and saw the ice sculptures that the kids, uh, school kids made out at City Forest this year. Pretty incredible. I wondered how that was going to go last Friday with the way the weather was. Right. But uh, obviously the snow was soft to make incredible sculptures. And then with the rain, they are frozen solid. I don't think they're going <laughs> anyway for a long time. So I'm glad they had that opportunity. And it was, if you get a chance, uh, go out and, and check those sculptures out. Well, I was very excited tonight. Kind of the most first time we more publicly spoke about, I'll call it the the adaptation uh, of more STEM-oriented curricula. And what's exciting to me, and there's much more to come in the future, is the integration of the curriculum and our structures. And I don't just mean the new school. Well, that's exciting and easy to focus on the rest of the elementary schools and what we're going to be doing there in terms of integration of curriculum and structures. Uh, you know, it's going to make Midland a, a paragon of, of of STEM throughout the country. Um, what I'm really looking forward to then is the next step in evolution, even though we haven't even started the first step, and that's going to be the middle schools. And uh, if there's an opportunity to really differentiate you know, amongst uh, not only public schools but private schools, it's going to be in the middle school area. And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping my legacy on the school board will be someday that we really change the middle school experience uh, and outcomes as a result. But, that's more to come later. No, no pressure, Brian. Um, <laughs> also, I think we missed to say today is Martin Luther King Day. And so I think the first year, if I'm not mistaken, we've uh, had that as a holiday for the yeah. school system. Right. But if uh, most people talk about that holiday being a day of service. And uh, towards that regard, and a little vested interest here, everybody knows my wife works at the tennis center and heavily involved in tennis center. Sim Financial is doing a service oriented promotion at, for the Dow Corning tournament that's coming up in two weeks. So each of you will be getting from me a tennis ball. And in that tennis ball is embedded a small little service component. Now, not to be worried about all the volunteerism we're already doing, uh, these are small little things. And the one I randomly picked out of the hopper, it, interesting enough, actually reflects to us. And it's for the Juvenile Correction Center, and it's to donate some fast food uh, certificates, coupons, whatever you want to call it, gift certificates that the structures can use as incentive programs for some of the things they're doing. So that's the kind of things that are in these. So you will each be getting a tennis ball from me. Thanks, Jerry. And, uh, and the only thing you have to do is do it. And I think you're supposed to do a reporting mechanism through SIM so they can kind of keep track of what all happened. So anyway, to honor Martin Luther King and Day of Service Day, you will be getting that from me. Excellent. I wanted to thank uh, Olivia, Harley, Isaiah for the wonderful cards tonight. I appreciate the uh, artwork mm -hmm. on the front and the thoughts on the inside. We'll work on the pencils for you here. Uh, sounds like it's a big problem there, so <laughs> we'll work on that. Um, Dale and, and Brian, I appreciate uh, your time, uh, the efforts tonight. I can't imagine uh, the amount of work that, that goes into things this, of this scope. Um, I like. Scott, I had a bunch of questions and comments, good questions, good comments on what was going on tonight. I know for me the biggest thing, I, well, one of the biggest things I took out of it was the, the green roof space and the possible environmental space in, in the back instead of just a pond. Uh, hits close to home for me. I really appreciate that attention to detail. I thought that no space goes unused or uh, it's all thought of. It's all part of the process and I think that's wonderful. Um, that and just like everybody else, thanks to the community foundations, uh, all the support and the, you know, the money. None of this could be possible without the support of Midland and not just the voters, but the, but the foundations as well. So Very good. that was all I had tonight. Thank you. I guess I'd like to say thanks to Jerry for you've been president and uh, the head of this board since I've been on it. So uh, just appreciate your leadership and where you've taken us. And uh, it's great to have you. Uh, helping us all along, so I like that. Well, thank you. And want to say thank you. Uh, as for tonight, uh, the presentations were fabulous. I think uh, the thing that it gets me the most excited is uh, knowing how uh, the community and the businesses and all the little pieces of what we've worked so hard for in the past couple of years are all part of the plan, the IB, the PYP, the um, as long as well as the new pieces uh, to really uh, enhance that STEM 
and uh, I'm excited about it. I'm really excited about it. And like you said, Jerry, it's for our our whole district, not just uh, one elementary school. But I'm excited for how that's going to replicate for everyone. Um, also, very appreciative of the cards from the Plymouth Elementary School gang. I had mine from last year, and um, it's wonderful to see the comments of uh, the elementary school kids. And one comment was uh, thanking me for my service, and even though we don't even get paid. I thought, <laughs> all right. <laughs> uh, payment comes in many different ways, though. So, uh, Martin Luther King Day, I found my, myself at the open door today and in came a Midland Public School teacher. And he said, um, oh, one of the students said on the announcements that it, Martin Luther King Day is a day to give back and they mentioned open door, so he came in and served meals. So I thought that was pretty cool. And when I looked around the room, I realized that probably 90% of the people in that room were middle and public school families, so very neat. Nice. All right, with that, okay, I'll turn it over to Mike. Yeah, can't leave me out. Um, no, I'll be real brief. Um, just uh, some updates on the bond work. You heard so much about bond work tonight, but I wanted to update you that at this point in time, um, Cook is demolished and it's being removed from the grounds as we speak. Parkdale was completed. There's probably some spring cleanup, if I'm saying that right, Daryl, um, as far as the, the landscape itself. Um, and you may not notice that Central, um, there is some outside demoing going on of outside structures, um, bleachers, items like that. But a lot of work has been going on inside separating the auditorium from the school. In fact, we saw a picture today where it is separate, separated. And, and remember, inside they'll be building a new wall that, that closes in the building from there. And so that, that will go on for another month or so before you'll begin to see classrooms actually come down. There's a lot of work going on inside of Central, <coughs> as we speak. Um, and the other part for me is uh, um, I do want to thank Jerry. Um, so got to know Jerry as you guys began to hire me and um, coming into a, um, a community of this size and trying to learn people's faces, names, and places. Jerry was great leadership in that, and I really enjoyed three years of leadership with him. I've only worked for three school board members, our school board presidents in my 10 years of superintendent, so another change as we go forward. <laughs> so thank you very much, Jerry. You're welcome. Bill. My pleasure. That's it. All right, with that, I will adjourn the meeting. Okay.